be part of the success of society and it cannot be successful um, on its own. So um, as uh, we discussed, we've been supporting UNICEF for the last year, we'll continue to do so. I, I must say, um, it's been quite difficult in a sense to, from our side to engage businesses. Uh, you have some leaders, who, a couple of leaders here, but you've also got IKEA particularly, who are prepared to talk and delve into this subject, but a lot of companies um, seem to skate over the surface and they say, oh, we've got so many sustainability issues, it's so, so many topics, you know, you're just trying to add another one to us. So I think one of the things I want to discuss today is actually, it's great to do all this work, but actually, is it a pipe dream to think that actually children's rights will be at the core of what business thinks about, or actually, will it always be on the periphery? And, and, and Mary, I just want to start with you, because obviously, you've been following human rights for a long time, and, um, you know, it's only in recent years through the rugby principles that, the, that business has started to engage in mm human rights at all on a, on a sort of consistent basis. So before we get into child rights specifically, I mean, what, what do you think the problems and the opportunities are in terms of business and its engagement with this issue? I think it is very interesting to see how this whole area has evolved. Uh, I remember when I was serving as High Commissioner for Human Rights, I had a small unit in my office on business and human rights, and it was all about the business is bad. It's extractive industries, it's indigenous peoples, it's destroying environments. It was all about tracking the bad of business. And then there was the launch of the Global Compact by Kofi Annan. And I was on the sort of inner group of that because the first two principles are about human rights, upholding the Universal Declaration, not being complicit in its violation. And then a business group started, the Business Leaders Initiative on Human Rights. And they came together, starting about eight of them. It was modeled on the Business Leaders Initiative on Climate Change. And human rights was a lot more difficult for business, as you were indicating. And uh, these companies in different sectors started to sort of probe this area. And thankfully, the, the debate itself at the international level was being moved on from a contentious issue of business saying, we can't take on all the responsibilities of government. You're trying to load us with too much responsibility. And it took the rigor the intellectual rigor and the determination of Professor John Ruggy and his team, and I was very supportive at the time. I was then post-High Commissioner working, uh, leading Realising Rights, so we worked very closely. And that's six years' work. First of all, to get governments to agree on the agenda, respect, um, protect, uh, sorry, um, protect, respect, um, and um, remedy it was very important. It said for the first time that governments have a responsibility to protect people from violations of their human rights by business. Never been clearly said before. And it said all corporations have responsibility to respect all human rights and we need better remedies, not necessarily court remedies, mediation remedies, all kinds of remedies. And then the next three years were developing these guiding principles to explain this system more clearly. Um, and in particular, the uh, scope and the idea of the, the due diligence involvement of, co of corporations and knowing <laughs> that they have to know what's happening in their company because they have to respect human rights. And then I was delighted uh, when uh, UNICEF and um, the Global Compact and Save the Children developed the principles in relation to child rights. Absolutely appropriate and I think very necessary. And I you know, read the materials knowing that we were a concluding panel, this, this high-level panel, and I think the reason why it's so important is actually in part of the briefing for the day two, if I may just quote, sure. you know, today there are 1.2 billion adolescents aged 10 to 19 worldwide, nearly 90% of whom live in developing countries. An estimated 71 million children of lower secondary school age are out of school, and 127 youth aged 15 to 24 are illiterate. We can't have a kind of social cohesion, social order in that world, and if anything, because of the population increases that we're going to have, um, that number is going to increase unless we address the issues. And so, you know, I can, we can come back to it, but I think we should be talking about short-term, middle-term, and longer-term responsibilities of, of corporations. And, and what do you think, a lot of corporations will say, you know, we're expected to do everything now. You know, we've got so many responsibilities. We've got our supply chains, we've got, you know, uh, our, our sort of uh, resource scarcity, we've got to deal with climate change, and now you want to add another one. And, and they're, they're feeling that sense of overload. And what would, you, what would your argument be to a business to say why it is important? Mm -hmm. apart, um, apart from this general idea that yeah. actually a healthy society, but, but they're, they're saying, well, we've got, we're here to make money. We're not here to help society. What is the argument that to cut through business? I, I think the core argument is, yes, 
um, corporations want to make money to sustain their business, but they have a contract with society and they have a position as corporations, they have tax positions, they have other positions, and they are because it's recognized that business is important and necessary, but it's not unrestrained. And it's part of that uh, recognition that led to the development of the guiding principles, uh, putting the major responsibility for human rights on, business, on the governments. They must protect, respect, and implement. Um, uh, the responsibility of corporations is to respect. It's a due diligence responsibility. I was very pleased that in the working on the child rights principles, quite rightly, it was felt, yes, it's important to respect the rights of children in that sense and for due diligence in that context, but corporations should go further and support children, should support um, ways of supporting children, and that's reflected in the, in the guidelines. And Mary, just finally, before we move on, I mean, the human rights already incorporates children, so it's not to say, but mm -hmm. it, it, is it that businesses almost have, I mean, why the need to have children specifically? I mean, is it that business tends to ignore the sort of the children of the, the female workers? And the, I mean, why, why, why yeah. the need for this? Why don't we just say, well, human rights covers everyone. Yeah. Why do we need another set of principles? Part of the reason is because children are very vulnerable. They're children. And uh, if they are involved in child labor, it can have severe impacts on them. Um, they're very affected by uh, atmosphere, by um, the air quality. Um, so emissions issues are important. Uh, health, uh, if children are stunted, they will never recover their full potential, um, physical and intellectual. So uh, just from that point of view, uh, it, it, it's, it's right. Um, it's also, I think, uh, you know, fair to say that uh, corporations do see that uh, respecting the rights of children and supporting children, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's a sort of, <coughs> Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an entry point into this area that corporation can actually grasp on the positive side. You know, and I think this is what uh, these companies um, have been doing. I've been actually seeing that it's good for corporate reputation, um, but it's also an important part of corporate responsibility. Right, and we're going to dive into detail, but while, I, yeah, just, just, uh, while we're operating at this top level view, I just want to talk about systems, because the, the one thing I hear from companies all the time is saying, Look, we can't do things on our own. You know, mm. the, the world is too yeah. fast, it's too complex, mm. and actually we need to have a systems approach. We need government, we need business, we need NGO, civil society. We all need to come together, but actually it's not business's role to sort of mm. push this agenda. So, so I'm just wondering, given that we live in such a complex world, how, how do we start to bring these groups together and find common solutions? Because business will say, well, look, you know, we're a business, we can't do, we can only do so much, and actually if you, if, if, we have a bit more responsibilities, then it's up to government to regulate us better. And I think that the uh, principles that were adopted by the Human Rights Council and unanimously endorsed the principles that John Ruggie and his team had worked on um, uh, reflect that primary government responsibility. And I would say now that governments have a responsibility to establish a sort of enabling environment for business to fulfill its part of the responsibility by incorporating um, internally into law and practice, um, the provisions of the... Of but the but do you think they're doing that effectively? I mean, in all honesty, I mean, obviously there's going to be a mixed picture, but I mean, is... is it's, a work, know, it's a work in progress at best. <laughs> the OECD is playing a role. Um, other organizations are, you know, are, are standardizing um, in their work um, the, uh, the rugby principles, and that, that all helps. Um, but it, it is a work in progress. And I think this initiative of UNICEF, working with companies, um, is an important part of that. It's, it's part of... Uh, making it the norm that corporations are expected and required indeed to respect all human rights, children's rights, and indeed to support because um, if you take in, in the poorest countries um, uh, the importance of uh, some sort of social protection system and corporations have the innovative capacity, whether it's you know, through communications and other ways of helping. They're not responsible for what the government should do, but we know that poor developing countries can benefit from a good relationship with the private sector in those companies and uh, in those countries and, and good innovative uh, technologies that will help social protection systems for, for one. Okay, thank you. Philip, Philip I, want to, I want to bring you in here because you, you work for Rep Risk, so you sort of look at the whole sort of environmental, social and governance issue. And um, tomorrow the United Nations Global Compact is launching its, uh, officially launching its CEO report. And, um, and so I, I'm, I will be beaten up if I say anything much about it. But, but essentially what it's saying is that the whole global 
corporate sustainability movement has ground to a halt, that it, it's reached a plateau, that companies are returning to short-term profitability, difficult environment, actually returning to what they know and trust, which is actually, they, and they, they can't prove the business case for action. So this is, this is a thousand CEOs saying that's not an outside group. This is actually the CEOs basically saying, we've hit a brick wall. So I just wondered from your perspective, I mean, child rights, is, is that really going to figure on companies on, on, on their radar? I mean, is it honestly going to make a difference? I think it's a very good question. Thank and you. I'm, I'm paid to ask for that. <laughs> God for that, eh? And I believe there might be some answers to that. And um, we should differentiate why companies do something. And um, one aspect is they are forced to good. I understand these two gentlemen have uh, taken this view, and I think that's one way to, to run a business very successfully. But another reason is there's something which are expectations from society, but also from the regulator, from the consumers. And one way to look at that is you can think of minimum standards. And nowadays, things like child labor are part of this minimum standards, or something companies have to consider. And there's another aspect. There's, first of all, that the minimum standards get more and more um, important. Um, the other aspect is that while already the generation of, of, of my parents considered child labor something really bad, why many companies haven't acted? And the reason for that is that the world was very intransparent. And I think now with somebody from the telecom industry here, what we should really state is the world becomes more transparent thanks to technology, some, thanks to telecommunication, thanks to, um, uh, to new smartphones, which means that what companies actually do in, in potentially remote places from, from, from a few of the headquarters, maybe somewhere in, in Switzerland, maybe somewhere in, in New York, actually gets known. And this is something businesses cannot ignore. I mean, there are many examples what happens if businesses ignore things. Um, and I mean, for me as a, as, a, as a Swiss, I mean, something which comes uh, immediately to my mind is tax evasion. Um, my friends here from Belgium, they have no good luck. Um, so uh, this is just bad business. This is just nowadays bad business. But I have, I have to defend the Swiss. The, the, the Swiss no, 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 no. We haven't but, got the time. Uh, the world, the, the message here, the world is changing. And, and the same is, for example, uh, the mining industry. Also, to take a Swiss example, if, if you look, for example, how Glencore has evolved. So the Glencore was one of the big uh, mining companies and, and trading companies. And it has evolved from a not a one-man show, but from, from a company which was very well connected in, in important places and has evolved to a company which now makes quarterly reporting because <coughs> the world has become more transparent. So I think this is one of the ultimate drivers, transparency, and the same is changing expectations. So for this reason, I'm, 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 I'm uh, quite optimistic that uh, business gets a message, and then we have some, some real leaders like here on the panel, which, which with their company show that you can actually even build success on, on, on doing uh, the right thing. And, and, and we'll come to those examples in a minute, but I, I just want to ask one more question around whether, um, whether companies really understand child rights, because you yourself said, the first thing you said was about, about uh, you know, child labor. So when, most people, when they think about children, think, oh, child labor, that, that's the big issue. But actually, you know, what I've learned is like through IKEA, looking at sort of uh, women in China who come, who move away from town to work. How, mm -hmm. how do they, how do they stay in touch with their children? It's a, it's about sort of you know advertising to kids. It's around so many, you know, you, go, you delve into any world and it becomes utterly complex. And child rights is one of those. Do you do you think there's a, enough understanding really what child rights mean? And and if Absolutely. and if so, how how do we build that into right. the thinking? Well, absolutely not. I mean, first of all, our clients, um, uh, big multinationals, investment banks, etc., they first look at the really uh, important things in terms of minimum standards. It doesn't say the other things are not important, but um, uh, if, you, if you violate uh, human rights standards, if you violate uh, standards regarding forced labor, etc., you're in trouble. So what about the children's rights? I have, I have to admit that um, when I had the great pleasure to help a little bit on the advisory committee of this UNICEF children's rights, I didn't understand what it was all about when I got the invitation. I looked at these 10 principles and I thought, oh, this makes a lot of sense. 
but but um, among business leaders, I mean, they are not familiar, with few exceptions, what children's rights really, really means. But if you look at this, um, and at least yesterday, you, you used to have them all 10 here. But, um, uh, you, if you look at them, it makes a lot of sense. But I think you, you must differentiate between the longer journey, which is uh, the full um, uh, the principles and, and the, the, the 10 different areas, and then really the minimum standards, which are more uh, at the level of force, labor, human rights violation, and, and uh, environmental degradation at a massive scale. So this is a journey. But the beautiful thing about uh, children's rights is something else. I mean, I'm the father of three, um, and that's why I easily connect. So, so when, when, I, when I ask my wife, shall I go to this other committee and, and, and participate? Then my wife said, yes, it's about the children. <laughs> Um, I mean, you know, in, in Switzerland, the uh, men are very much driven by their, by their wives. So, um, and it's, 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 it's fun. I can, I, can, I can easily connect to that. And I think Was that your defense of Switzerland? I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Switzerland is a great country. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, everybody can connect to that. And that's actually the, the interesting thing about uh, the business leader, is if you can connect to something, um, human rights, uh, as a protection of human rights, uh, hel helping here, etc. This is something people love to contribute. It's a much more difficult topic, for example, climate change. I mean, I'm a climatologist, but I have no arms when it comes to climate change regarding uh, uh, businesses. But, uh, but I think the beautiful thing of this children's rights is that everybody can connect. And this brings a lot of more. I mean, your agenda, uh, Mr. President, about the human rights in a broader sense, I mean, this is really a, a way to further and enhance this, this agenda. So I think um, it's a fabulous topic for CEOs to work on, and it's a fabulous topic for chairmen and chairmen to work on and, and, and to, to leave them off. What is the relevance? of the telecoms industry to children. Just, just you know, all of us will probably have a clue, but just, just to state it, why, why is a telecoms company interested in child rights? It's interesting, actually, because um, children are not really our customers, and they're not really our suppliers. So we really probably have very little to do with children. But if you start out from the right place, and, and you know, I think my colleague on my right here um, does, you start out from a position that what are you about? And actually, I fundamentally disagreed with you about when you said that you know, businesses are just about making profit. Uh, of course, you can make profit by being very exploitative, and you can do lots of bad things to make money if that's what it's about. But we start out by saying, you know, our purpose is to transform lives, because we think we are working in an industry which will transform lives. And so when we look at children, and we look at lots of other stakeholders as well, um, you know, we say our purpose actually is to deal with this issue. Now, child rights, do we pretend we know what the child rights are? Um, no, we don't. Actually, some of this is, is very accidental. Some of the examples that I can give you are things which we've done despite not knowing what the rights were. And, you know, I, I, at the panel I was at in Stockholm earlier this year, the question was children's rights, do we know and do we care? And, you know, I posited that the answers were no and no. <laughs> the, the convention was passed in 1989, and even in this room, where we have stakeholders who know about these things, uh, you know, there's 54 uh, articles, I think, in, in that particular convention. And, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to summarize it well. Uh, one of the good things about principles is that actually does distill it in terms of businesses, the 10 things that you should be doing. Um, so, no, we don't know what those rights are. Children are the meek and the weak. And, you know, they don't have a voice, they don't have a vote, they don't have money. And so why should we care about them? Why should we care about their rights? Notwithstanding that, we said, you know, let's not just distill this down to... Um, you know, what can we get out of children? Let's think about what is the right thing to do. And that's why we've done some of the things that we've done. Not because we were thinking about rights, but we thought, let's transform the lives of these children. And, and, and just out of interest, a, a, a lot of times when it comes to sustainability, it becomes one senior member of an organization that sort of gets what it means and becomes passionate about it. And it's not something that often happens just because it's a, a, a business um, Priority. So I'm just wondering, was this something that, that came from you personally? Was it something that someone came to you with? What, what's, how, how did it come about? Well, I was lucky because what I did was to inherit the leadership of a company that actually already got it. And so I, you know, I had 4,000 people still working in the company, and, and they got it, so it was easier. 
Uh, but the role of the leader is very much about um, uh, trying to get the vision, articulate the vision, and get the people to come with the vision. And I think we've, we've done that reasonably well. And when it comes to um, NGOs working, because you're clearly a business leader who gets it there, I could put a thousand people on the stage who would say, this is nothing to do with us and uh, you know, we're, we are about short-term profits and this is our shareholder. So, so what, if you were an NGO like UNICEF going to a business that didn't get it, what, what would be your argument to actually try and engage with them? What, 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 what's the best? I, th I think, you know, my only statement is that you can make money in lots of ways. If your purpose is just to make money, then there are lots of ways you can do it. If your purpose is to make a difference, and you have to make a difference if you want to have a sustainable business. You know, for my successor and the, the, the person, the man or woman who takes over after them, for them to have a business, we have to do the right things today. Because the tree, you know, we don't plant our own trees to sit under. Our fathers and grandfathers did that. Um, and so, you know, we need to, to, to kind of get our heads around that piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just about today. Okay. And be before I come to set it, Mary, just come back to you. I mean, my experience of business is that uh, Bob is, a, is not, uh, not your normal businessman, who, who most businessmen don't argue that way. I mean, is, what's your experience of working in the world of business, you know, behind the scenes, so not mm. the public face, about what the arguments mm. are, why they don't mm. get involved, or whether, why they don't care? I mean, what, what's your experience? Uh, I, I, I must say, um, I'm probably luckier, maybe it's because I'm on panels like this, but I do come across um, business leaders uh, like you, um, very successful business leaders, because you've actually, as you said, thought through how to be innovative, how to stay ahead, and how to actually uh, um, uh, energize your workforce, because they feel that they're proud to be part of the company, which is important. I learned a lot um, in this Business Leaders Initiative on Human Rights, where I listened to corporations talking about the real nitty-gritty, the nitty-gritty of being, you know, sort of accountable. I mean, I, you know, uh, I wanted to take up the point about climate because I find it a very helpful point in relation to children, because I have this foundation on climate justice, and we are talking more and more about intergenerational justice. We are uh, creating a very, very difficult world for our children and their children and grandchildren. I mean, I too, I'm a grandmother. I talk a lot about my four grandchildren who will be in their 40s in 2050. They'll share the world with nine billion others. And it will be a very unsafe in the sense of a world that will suffer much more climate shocks. And I often pose the question, what will they think about us? You know, those children who will be in their 40s in 2050, the nine billion, what will they think about us leading up to 2015 and whether or not we get a proper uh, uh, agenda for post-2015 development, whether we get a climate robust fair agreement, is going to matter hugely to them. So that's a kind of connection that I think if we thought about it more, it would bring child rights closer to us. It's about what are you doing about your emissions um, levels? Do you think about children in that? Um, those companies that use security, do they have guards trained to deal with children? I mean, it's, it's right across the board, it's, it's a question of but, thinking, um, you know, thinking through. What but that has to be deeply are. felt, hasn't it? I, I just came from a conference in Istanbul and I, half the people who came on stage talked about, well, we have to think about our children's future. But actually, most often it's just words, they mm. just say it. But mm. you have to actually, mm. I mean, like Bob, you have to deeply feel, mm. don't you? You can't mm. just... Verbalize. Yeah. You have to I, actually I, I, go I, into the feeling I, of what the yeah, world will be like. Yeah. I kind of feel it so deeply at this stage that I can almost hear the voices criticizing us. Um, how could they be so stupid? Yeah. How could they be so blind and ignorant? I mean, th that's, yeah. that's what they will say, unless we very dramatically improve our record. Yeah. And that's what they would be entitled to say. And, it, you know, it's a, so it's that, it's that longer term... Intergenerational justice is one area, but um, I, I think also uh, you know, that um, the, the reality is business needs uh, social stability for better customers, but it, so it's, it's in that kind of interest. And governments can be influenced by business, as I think has happened in Thailand, and from, from what I heard, and that, that's another role that, that business can play. Okay, so Seto, let, let's come to you. So um, again, construction company, children, what's the connection? I think I, I mean, I add on to what you asked Philip earlier about what are children's rights. You know, it, it's, 
you can write the whole Bible about it, the definition and all those. But I think you have you don't have to look very far. You look at your own kids. I, I'm sure most of you here have children. Would you like your kids to be laying bricks, digging holes on the ground, building condominiums? Or would you like to see them in school? I mean, clearly the answer is children's place is at school, not at work site to earn money for their parents. <coughs> that's not the way to go. I think that's, that's, that's very simple. You don't have to get fancy about the definition of uh, the children's rights and all those. You don't want them to work. You want them to be in school. They have 40, 60 years ahead of them when they get out of school and they can work. I mean, you know, you, you, people tend to forget about common sense. This is common sense, really. And, and what Mary was saying earlier about contract with society, hmm. right? We as the CEO, we have a difficulty balancing between the four pillars. Shareholders, customers, employees. And the last thing people always forget is society. You want to deliver the highest possible return to shareholders. You want to give the best bonus to the employee. You want to build the best house for the customers. What about society? And you know, you, you, that's, I, I, I think it, it's made you think that construction, building condos, and children. You, know, it, it's, you need to pay attention. You need to make sure that children are at the right place at the right time. It's not for the time for them to be working in the construction site. When they are 10, 12, 14, they need to be at school. Would you want your kid to be at a construction site? The answer clearly is no. I mean, as industrial leader, people with a connection with the government, I think it's, it's the least that I could possibly do for the, for the child rights. So I want to bring something that, that, that uh, Mary said, and this is this, this uh, intergenerational thing. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> for us in Safari, what we did when I first started is we defined who the critical stakeholders. And actually came up with eight sets of stakeholders, you know, regulators and governments, etc. And we had society, but actually we broke society down. We said, you have society, which is what you do now, but also about future generations. And so whatever we do, we say, how will it affect mm. these stakeholders? Sure, the future generation is not even here yet, but you have to make sure you create a world which, in which you know, they, will, they will prosper. And Bob, I, I came across a company uh, a while ago, a, a, a sort of car company, a sort of electric type prototype car company, and it's, one of its directors is a sort of future generation generations uh, director. I mean, is, you know, is that, obviously that was quite sort of way out there, but I mean, how do you build that into the thinking? Because business is very complex, you've got loads of staff, how do you actually embed that thinking into, the, especially the middle managers? I remember Paul Polman at the CEO of Unilever said it takes at least a year to go through each layer of, of, of management. And so, so, again, it's great that you've got two business leaders here who say it's important. But I want to get now to a bit more granular level. How do you drive that really into the business so that people are really, when they're making those decisions, are thinking about that rather than about the quality and the deliverability and the price and the, the, the core business principles? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, you, the first thing you need to do is you need to get some strong evangelists. And I have an evangelist here, you know, Sandra, who is. Um, sitting in the middle of the room. So Sandra is a great evangelist. She is, Where is she? Stand up! Stand up so. <laughs> <laughs> but you need to get a few of these evangelists around the, the company to help you graduate, because otherwise you can't, you can't do very well. But really articulating this whole thing, you know, if you, you cannot come into a Safari Club building without seeing the words transforming lives. Hmm. What are we here for? We are here to transform it. Of course we also make a profit. And incidentally, when you do that, you can also transform life by doing that. But our primary purpose in life is to transform life. Well, I just want to push on that because it's, it's great to have evangelists. I, I run a sustainability vision and strategy at The Guardian, so you need those champions. But those champions often feel isolated, and actually you need processes, and mm -hmm. you need it to be driven into structures and processes. So how do you do that? When you are, again, when you articulate the strategy of the company, and you know, we have it on one page. Our strategy is written just on one page. It says our mission is to transform lives. How do we go about doing that? And what are the strategic priorities in order to achieve that? And none of those strategic priorities are at odds with this purpose of transforming lives. 
Right. And, and just finally, before we move on, in terms of NGO relationships, so you're working obviously with UNICEF, and I'll come to you on that. So um, everyone talks about the power of collaborations, as I said earlier, but collaborations are very, very difficult. You've got two cultures meeting, you've got different priorities meeting. Um, what, how have you found the relationship with UNICEF? And I don't want you to be nice, too nice to them. Um, <laughs> and, and what would, and in order to help you not be too nice to them, uh, what would you recommend that they do? So, so they're trying to drive this into business. It's not going to be an easy task by any stretch of the imagination. What is your advice to them? And then um, I see Philip nodding said, so I'm definitely going to come to him as well. Mm -hmm. well, well <coughs> UNICEF is one of the NGOs clearly that we work well with. We don't work well with all of them because they don't have the same mindset. And what we get out of them is, uh, you know, working on the uh, business principles and child rights um, has helped us to frame, you know, how we approach this issue. We've just, Sandra has actually just um, drafted up our first child rights policy because we realized we didn't have a policy, we were just kind of one thing around. So now we have, it's codified, and this is where UNICEF will really help us. What I would, the advice that I give UNICEF, however, is to stop seeing the private enterprise only as a funding partner. Mm. You know, see us as being a partner we can do other things for us, it's technology. You know, we can give you bags of technology to do lots of stuff. Um, I'm not saying that they, that they do only see us as being, <laughs> see my local so, uh, <laughs> 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 like never. He, he in fact doesn't see us as, as a funding partner, but I think more generally, I would say um, for NGOs and people like you so, um, look beyond that which is just about cash. Okay, so, so the same question to you, which is, what would your advice be again? for UNICEF saying, okay, they've got the structure, they've got the principles, they've done these two days about trying to help get sort of the toolkit ready and the, the sort of documentation and all that, that sort of stuff and get it countries to take ownership for that. So that's all the preparation <coughs> stuff. But then when they go out onto, uh, onto the streets and actually try and get supporters, um, what's, what do they need to be doing differently or better or than they are doing now? First of all, they're nice. They're nice. Yeah, no doubt about it. They have been... All of them. So far, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't get out of here alive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is what we're saying, you know, just there are other aspects in which private sector can help, not just donation. You know, it, it's, I'm not saying that they come only to us only for donation, but there are other collaboration, uh, like educating our staff together, not just the CEO pushing down the ideas on them, working at all levels between staff at all levels, getting them going out on a field trip, getting them to see the real problem. And I think the easiest way to get people so-called interested in a, in a cause that we are, we are proposing is to start off with something easy, something non uh, controversial, you know, like uh, you know, global warming, which is very difficult to understand. But children, I mean, or we'll go back to the common sense. Children, we all care about children. You bring them out on the field, seeing malnutrition uh, children, seeing all the problems. I think that's that's one of the key to get people involved. Once you get the whole organization behind the idea of what the CEO is doing, I think it's it's forward movement from there on. Okay. Mary, I just want to bring you on that because you, you, were, you wanted to say something, but, but say what you want to say, but also just wanted to ask you about, you know, you're, you're saying you can almost hear those generations, where, and that, that is not a conversation that's easy to have in a boardroom, hmm. but it's something, and, and as I said, it's, 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 it comes from an, hmm. a, from an experiential approach. Hmm. Now, just going on saying children are important, everyone's going to say, oh, yes, you're right, hmm. but that's not going to create hmm. change. So what, what would your response be to how you drive that change and get that up? Okay, I'll come back to that. But what I really wanted to uh, take up, um, because yeah. I'm, I'm a straight talker and always I was, know. even when I was uh, fully working in the UN, now I'm only half working in the UN with the Great Lakes mandate, but uh, I actually think that uh, the tightening of the UN budget did lead to agencies being of necessity right. uh, close to the private sector in a kind of funding. And I, what I like about this initiative um, child rights and business principles is it is actually uh, what UNICEF should be doing and I'm glad is doing, which is putting the responsibility and, and having that kind of relationship. And I think that that's, that's important. And I think, you know, pushing to have a bit of accountability in it. You know, are you, are you holding yourselves to account? Are you talking about the problem areas? Are you, you know, um, making it real 
not just um, good PR, um, which I know it isn't in, in, in your case quite clearly from what you're saying. It's part of your, your government policy. But, but for UNICEF to be more challenging. Uh, yeah, to be challenging. Uh, to you not know, just because, say, because I, it's yeah. not that, that sort of cup yeah. in hand, yeah. can yeah. they give us some money, yeah. but to say, yeah. actually, this yeah. is what you need yeah. to be doing. I mean, as High Commissioner for Human Rights, I used to have a sort of almost a mantra. The greatest contribution of the United Nations is its normative framework. It's a wonderful thing that we have this Convention on the Rights of the Child, which we may not be expert in, but a wonderful innovative part of it is child participation. So next step might be a bit more child participation in your children's policy. Get some discussion. What do these children think about it? You know, it's an interesting idea that uh, they can have a voice on these things. And, and um, in particular, uh, you know, interrogate uh, whether, in fact, um, <coughs> Uh, you, you're, you're sort of accountable in a, in a positive sense for, for the policies because you're both... And also, if you uh, develop a child policy, that's a good um, precedent for other companies, you know, to have. Uh, so, in fact, you're, you're creating, what, which is what we want from the Ruggie principles and from the children's principles, corporations now to make the running of standards because then you put a peer pressure on other companies and, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a good incentive. And I've forgotten your earlier question. Well, let, let's forget about that, because right. your, your yeah. answer was much better than my question. <laughs> but, 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 uh, but, sorry, but, but, but I haven't <laughs> forgotten about your question about uh, UNICEF. Um, but before I answer that, I first want to defend business. I mean, if you are at a public company, you have quarterly reporting, if you don't deliver, you get fired. That's reality. You still get a nice package, never a couple of millions, but you lose all the status, it's not fun. This has happened recently at Siemens, for example, German company, it happens all the time in the US and every country. You're under huge pressure if you work at a public listed company. You're under huge pressure. And that's, pressure what, has to, to and that's what has costs. to change. That's what has to change. Yeah, but, but the point here is. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the system. But, but <laughs> don't put him off his stride, Mary. Let him finish and then you can put him off. Sorry. Sorry. But the point here is, UNICEF, I, I think, it's as the next step after this wonderful 10 principles, is that maybe the, the, the targeting should set in and the UNICEF people should think, is this company be targeted just to fulfill the minimum standards? Because I strongly believe there are some minimum standards, especially related to uh, child labor, etc. Or is this maybe an opportunity that uh, this company can do more? And if it made an opportunity, also the company looks great. Maybe it's a, it's a company, and let's make this, this example again. Maybe it's a company like UBS that put a little bit of fashion. Maybe I've heard of UBS, it's this bag. <laughs> UBS is back, the biggest wealth manager of, 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 of this planet. I'm proud of it. And I'm also proud of it because they take human rights extremely seriously. And they took this case as a, as a, as a way to rebuild the reputation. So that's maybe then a company, uh, Victor should, and Lina should target and go to the CEO of UBS and say, shall we do more? Shall we do something with children's rights? But I think that's, this would be my advice to, to UNICEF. Let's, let's um, target companies according to, um, uh, to their possibilities. Your Majesty, the Queen, um, President Robertson, Mr. Jenkins, uh, ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon to everyone. I think the program um, for this workshop uh, promised two days of learning, innovation, inspiration and solution building. And I think by both Victor's summary just now and the very engaging panel discussion that we just had, I think that's exactly what you've got. Businesses have shared their experiences in applying the children's rights and business principles we discussed new tools and examples of due diligence and real out-of-the-box thinking took place, including around innovative solutions, which again, I think, shows um, exactly what the big value of our partnerships with private sector is beyond fundraising, and I agree entirely with what the panelists said on that. I hope you will forgive me that now I have the floor and hopefully your attention that I have to pick up on the, the challenge that was put to us uh, from the podium. And let me be very brief on that because yes, absolutely, UNICEF and its leadership stands for children's rights, particularly those of the most disadvantaged. 
And it's actually our policies and our interventions that are specifically targeted to these most disadvantaged children. And we do that in many ways, and I think the children's rights and business principles is a good example for that. I listened very carefully. Oh, I can promise you that I will personally practice to be less nice. <laughs> I don't know whether I'll succeed in that, but I personally also feel that very often by being nice but firm, you actually get better results. So it's been a, a rich experience, and we're all inspired, I think, to now take specific ideas on children's rights and business forward. And I'm particularly pleased that, as Bob Victor said, the corporate uh, lab uh, is now going to go ahead and we need, I think, uh, what to do. We need to jointly identify the specific challenges and opportunities related to children's rights there and work on uh, industry-specific guidance on areas of interest to both business and, and Joseph. And as we saw, there were many other comments and we will, of course, use all your feedback and inputs from these two days to finalize the lab program and then begin implementing the platform next year. The experience of the last two days has also reaffirmed our commitment to work together. And we will continue to work with all stakeholders, business, but also academia, consultants, and CSR think tanks. And together with Save the Children and UN Global Compact, we will reach out to civil society. The approach of building and working through extended key partnerships will be critical if we want to make progress on this crucial issue for children's rights. Finally, a few words of thanks. We are grateful to all of you, to all our speakers, for taking the time to join us uh, here. I'm sure we all have very busy schedules, so it's really appreciated. A special thanks goes to Her Majesty the Queen of Belgium, for your continued commitment to the issue of child rights and business and your dedication is a great asset for our colleagues uh, in, uh, in Belgium, but it's also making an impact here at, the, at a global level. And your support to put children's rights at the center of corporate sustainability is both compelling and inspiring. President Robertson, thank you for being with us today. I know it was a close call. We have um, been a true pioneer in this field and we're very privileged to have been able to benefit from your vast experience going back to the early days of the debate on the topic of business and human rights. And your work has actually motivated us to put a specific focus on children's rights in the, in the business agenda. Thank you for that. Thanks also to the other members uh, of the high panel just now, high level panel just now, Bob of uh, Safaricom, Philip of Repris, Cheta of South Siri, and to all the speakers on the other panels and in the working groups. A big thank you for showing vision, leadership, and commitments to take action. And please go and continue to convince others. I hope in the last few days all the participants have been challenged but also inspired, and that each of you, whether you're from business, civil society, or government, will leave UNICEF House with a better understanding of what it means to bring a child rights perspective to sustainability and with a commitment to move the agenda forward. Organizing an event like this is hard work and can only be done with a commitment, collaboration and support of many. And indeed, many have contributed to its success and I'm grateful to all of you for your efforts. In particular, I would like to thank Susan McPherson for so capably moderating the sessions during day one. Frog Design, whose team has volunteered numerous hours in preparing for the sessions and got us to really think out of the box about innovation around children's rights and business. Joe, for our closing fact, for facilitating our closing uh, panel and thank you for challenging us and the speakers to really focus on what matters and what we, including UNICEF, need to do. And Marshall events for ensuring that the program went smoothly and that all the de details from catering to AV were thoughtfully organized. Last not, but not least, I would like to thank my own team in UNICEF under the leadership of Leila and, and Bob Victor for pulling this uh, all together. Great work. And again, thank all of you for your contributions and support 
during these last two days. I wish you safe returns if you've traveled to come here and look forward to continue working with you to make sure that children are indeed everybody's business. It is indeed a journey, as Philip just said, but let me end with a quote from one of the panelists yesterday who said, there is no question children's rights should simply be part of responsible business practices. Thank you.